The American College of Cardiology is pleased to present this online education program titled Patient Navigator Program Focused MI. Where are we now, two years later? It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Susan Rogers, MSN, RN, AACC. Susan, welcome. Thanks, Kendra. <clears throat> welcome, everyone. And I must say, it's been a pretty exciting two years for us here at the ACC, and we couldn't have gotten to the place where we are now without every one of you participating in this program, and sharing your ideas, building this network. Um, has just been um, an amazing opportunity for so many of you. And once we have all of our final data, we'll set up another time for a final webinar and I'll be able to share all the work that everyone has done. So we're very excited about this. This is um, our last scheduled webinar for 2019, and we'll be sending out webinar announcements once um, all of our final data is in for the program so we can close it out. So I'll go through the agenda. Um, Today we are lucky to have um, two of our national hospitals um, in the program presenting on the Patient Navigator webinar. Um, we have um, our hospital, Hardin Memorial Hospital. We have Jamie Wilkinson, who is the Director of Cardiovascular Services, Amber Shaw, who is the Clinical Data Coordinator, and Teresa Lee, who is the Case Manager. And then from Memorial Hospital, University of Colorado Health, we have Melissa Barnes, who is the manager for the clinical quality, and Lisa Myers, who is the cardiovascular coordinator for the chest pain center. We look forward to hearing what um, both of you, your teams um, have to share with us. I'd like to ask one thing before we get started, is that if you are in the room um, at your facility and you um, have more than just yourself in the room, if you could just enter in the chat box how many people are sitting with you in your room. That would be great. That will help us keep a good count of um, the number of attendees who are coming to the webinar. So now I'll go ahead and hand it off over to Julie. And Julie, we're not able to hear you. Just want to make sure you have your line unmuted. There, you go. there we go. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, my name is Julie Dobade, and I am the program manager for the Patient Navigator Program uh, Focus MI. Um, and what I'd like to do is go over uh, just a quick overview to kind of tell you where we are and give you a little bit of information about the program. So what um, we're seeing here is a map of all our participants and where they are, the starred um, Points on the map are our diplomat hospitals, and then the circles are our non-diplomat hospitals. We do have one in international hospitals that is participating in the program. Uh, the Patient Navigator Program currently has 72 hospitals participating, and as I said, 15 of those 72 are considered diplomat hospitals, and those hospitals were chosen from the original 35 Patient Navigator uh, Program hospitals. And they not only collect uh, the facility track metrics that all of the other hospitals collect, but they are following patients and collecting data at 30 and 90 days post-discharge. So one of the, the key um, successes from the original program was the development of a compendium of best practices. And the compendium of best practices was a compilation of all the tools that were used and developed by the original navigator participants to meet the metrics of the program. The compendium of best practices is located on our Quality Improvement for Institutions website. And one of the one of the main focuses of the entire program, both the original uh, patient navigator program and Focus MI, was really to look at and try to reduce uh, readmission rates. And the 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 compendium of best practices was set up in a way that. It lists out each metric, and then as you click on the metric, it uh, shows you all of the tools 
and strategies that you could use to meet each metric. Some of our top downloaded tools from the Compendium of Best Practices it has to do with reducing readmission. So as you see 1A, 30-day unadjusted readmission rates, some of the tools you'll find in there are readmission review templates, uh, interview tools for readmissions, some order sets, and things like that. For the focus of my program, the hospitals have also been building tools and strategies to help meet some of the metrics. So I listed out on this table some of the key metrics that they're focusing on, and then on the right-hand side, some of the tools and strategies that have been implemented. So for the 30 and 90-day unadjusted readmission rates, there are some tracking tools to understand the reasons for readmission. Um, many of the hospitals are also looking at the social determinants and how they impact readmission rates. Incorporating um, care managers into your team and having them take on a little bit more responsibility with follow-up and risk assessment and education. And then looking at some specific disease medication cards um, to target the education that the patients are getting. Cardiac rehab uh, referral and attendance and, of course, overall defect-free care are always big goals for, um, have been for our Navigator hospitals. So many of our hospitals are looking at standardized criteria for education. Um, and actually incorporating the cardiac rehab staff into making that initial visit while the patients are in the hospital to help with attendance post-hospitalization, and then reaching out into the community to connect them with other cardiac rehab uh, centers, having gyms and in the cardiac intermediate care units to exercise the patients a little bit earlier, and then a big one is adjusting the hours uh, so that they can um, get tailored to working patients so earlier in the day, in the mornings, and maybe a little bit later at night. Uh, pharmacy has always been a big um, component of uh, our navigator programs, and they have incorporated those uh, pharmacy participants on their teams, so they pharmacy does a little bit of the teaching for the medications, sees the patients, et cetera. Over the last few years, you've heard from many of our diplomat hospitals, and we felt it was really important to also hear from other hospitals participating why they've joined the program, some of the challenges and, and successes, collecting the additional uh, care, transi care transition metrics, and how they've been able to, to really move the needle in their facilities. So I'm going to pause at this time and pass it on to the folks at Harden Memorial Hospital to share their story. Thank you, Ms. Julie. Can you hear me OK? Yes. All right, good deal. This is Jamie Wilkerson from Hard Memorial Hospital. I'm the director of our cardiovascular service line here. I'll jump right in and talk a little about our facility here. So Hard Memorial, we're located in South Central Kentucky. We're a 300-bed facility that services a population of about a half a million people. <clears throat> One of our biggest challenges is where we're located. We're actually surrounded by 10 counties, um, and we're, like I said, we're right in the middle of those counties. So we've got 58 off-site locations that we consider brick and mortar uh, that we draw a lot of patients from our outlying counties into the facility here. Uh, we also serve 75,000 plus people in our emergency department, which that puts us as the largest ER actually in the state of Kentucky, and a lot of that is because of our draw from our other counties here. 
Uh, and that's a little bit about Hard Memorial as a whole. I'm actually going to pass this on to Amber Shaw, and she's going to talk a little bit about the reasons why we chose to participate. Okay. So we chose to participate with the Patient Navigator Program after our Director of Quality noticed that our AMI readmission rates were much higher than the national average. Um, we also, our Chief of Cardiology requested that we monitor all AMI patients we currently have a robust STEMI program in place that's very successful, but we wanted to improve outcomes for all of our AMI patients. Our primary focus when we started the program was that we wanted to do a concurrent identification process to help facilitate the education discharge needs of our patients with ultimately the goal of reducing our readmission rates. <coughs> Prior to partic participation with the program, we did have, or we do have, AMI bundles in place, which are built into our EHR for our bedside RNs. This helps them address um, cardiac medications within 24 hours of arrival and also at discharge. If for some reason the patient is not discharged on one of these medications and there's not a contraindication, <clears throat> they are to address it with the physician. And just to chime in a little bit there, that concurrent process, that identification method that we tried to identify, that was that was very challenging for us and was very primary motivator of us getting into the Navigator program itself. So we decided to focus today on two of the facility tracked measures. 5A, uh, AMI patients assessed for risk of readmission prior to discharge. And 5B, AMI patients who are risk assessed for risk of readmission and have deployed interventions based on the risk score. <clears throat> and on the following slides, we'll talk about strategies that we have implemented um, <clears throat> to help with this. Um, our main priority was getting our case managers involved. They were already looking at our high risk populations like CHF, COPD, diabetes. Um, anybody that scored high on the LACE risk tool. Um, unfortunately, our AMI patients, a lot of those do not score very high on the LACE risk tool, so we had to come up with a way to identify these patients concurrently. So we did that by um, working with our IT department and um, having them do a troponin list um, that the case managers receive every morning. And there was a lot of back and forth on this. They, they weren't receiving a full list uh, of troponins, but eventually we got those, those worked out. Um, also, they like to make sure, we wanted to make, make it a priority that the patients were seen within 24 hours of arrival to go ahead and start the education process to see if there were going to be any discharge needs um, and things like that. Um, some other things that we've done, we update our EHR to help facilitate documentation for the case managers. It has some prompts and things in there. Um, our education department, um, they did some education for our case managers to review the most current treatment of AMI patients. And then we also uh, collaborated with our cardiac rehab. Um, we were seeing a lot of our STEMI patients get orders for cardiac rehab but our non-STEMI patients were kind of falling through the cracks. So now we're able to capture more of those for follow-up in our cardiac rehab facility. <clears throat> and I'm going to, um, our case manager, Teresa Lee, she is going to talk about some things that they implemented. So once the case managers got involved, uh, one of the first things that were identified was the need to assess these patients. So what we did was uh, we were triggered to see AMI patients by the use of the troponin list that Amber spoke of. A discharge planning assessment is completed within 24 hours of admission to identify any barriers or needs that the patient or family may have. We also implemented uh, care progression standing orders uh, that were put into place for the case, ma case managers to use to help facilitate quality patient care and expedite preparations for any potential discharge needs. We are also now using PERC Education, which PERC stands for Patient Education Reference Center, and that is a database solely for patient education materials. 
It also is integrated within our EMR and allows the document, documents to automatically attach to the patient's record. One of the first things that we identified when we started assessing this, these patients was a large population of them. This was the first time they had been hospitalized or had a major medical issue. Therefore, many of them did not have a primary care provider. We put in place for a daily roster of Hardin Memorial providers that accept any new patient being discharged, and the patient will be seen by that primary care provider within three to five days of discharge for a transition of care visit. Follow-up appointments with cardiology were also a priority to make sure that those were made prior to the patient leaving the facility. Another hurdle that we encountered was the need for financial assistance and prescription coverage. Um, we do serve um, a very poor community. So many of these patients did not have prescription insurance or did not have enough prescription insurance. <coughs> We have a very unique community health clinic in our area that will act as a PCP, provide medications, and do screenings for appropriate insurance coverage free of charge. If, uh, if there is a need, the case manager will make an appointment with the community health clinic to make sure that the patient is seen within 48 hours of discharge. We also have implemented a retail pharmacy in-house that now offers 340B pricing. And if the patient qualifies, we will provide 30 days of medication free of charge for that patient. We also have a case manager that is in place that solely does follow-up phone calls to these AMI patients. The initial call is made within 72 hours of discharge to assess that the patient received all their medications, understands how to care for themselves, we remind them of follow-up appointments, answer any questions for them, and follow up on the process of their cardiac rehab. Something else that we've done is we have made sure that as soon as, our, as, soon as we see these patients, they are provided with a case manager's name um, and contact information so that any where uh, while they're in-house or even after they're discharged, they are welcome to call and ask questions. We also have a case manager that does home telemonitoring. And what this is, this is a free program uh, where the patient um, has a scale, a blood pressure cuff, and a pulse oximeter that is set up in their home. This is free uh, to patients that qualify. Um, and we have a nurse that monitors um, the vital signs daily. Um, what she will do is if she notices that the blood pressure is high or the patient is symptomatic, she immediately calls that patient. She will set up follow-up appointments uh, for the, call, uh, the cardiologist. She communicates back and forth for any medication needs, any symptom management. Um, Initially, this is for 90 days, and like I said, it is a free program. Uh, our equipment comes from Philips, but if we need to extend that, then we will do so. <coughs> okay. So some roadblocks that we have experienced. Um, the biggest hurdle was the identification, concurrent identification of the AMI patients with the troponin list. So like I mentioned before, it did take several months for us to get that established and to get the case managers an accurate list. Also, we do miss some patients because we, don't, we do not have 24-7 um, coverage, their case managers do not work on weekends, and then sometimes they are short-staffed. But even with that, on the next slide, uh, you'll see how much we have improved. When we first started the Patient Navigator Program, our baseline data showed um, in July and August of 2018 that we were at identifying these patients about 0 to 7 percent of the time. So after we <coughs> implemented our various strategies, you can see in July and August of 2019, we um, are now identifying 87 to 91 percent of the patients. And like I mentioned before, the patients that were, um, that are missed, <clears throat> because of not having case management available, they actually do make follow-up phone calls with them, um, even if they didn't see them here in the hospital, just to make sure that they have all their discharge needs and to see if they need any assistance. 
And then ultimately our goal when we started the program was to reduce our readmission rates. And as you can see, for fourth quarter 2018, we were at 18.42%. And we have nicely trended down. Um, second quarter 2019, we were at 5.56%. And third quarter two, 2019, we were at 6.82%. Um, so we do feel like it's been very success, successful. We do follow up and review the patients that um, were readmitted to see if there was anything that we could have done differently, anything that we can improve upon. Um, and that's about it. Good job, ladies. And from my standpoint, uh, this is Jamie again, Director of Critical Care and Cardiovascular Service. Um, you know, what's really set us apart from here, our, our medical, our Director of Cardiology really wanted to start focusing in on these AMI patients concurrently, initially from the hospital. So. What this patient navigator program has allowed us to do is really push towards that to where case managers are seeing these patients while they're in the hospital, they're making discharge phone calls when they're home, we're finding ways to implement monitoring processes to ensure that blood pressure is good, their medication regimen is good, and they actually, from a social support standpoint, really focusing in on, okay, what do you need when you leave the hospital? What do you need at home? to ensure that you're not going to get readmitted back into our facility. So the case manager piece of it really is what got our readmit, readmission rate down. I know we're going to wait till questions till afterwards. And I think now it is time for the University of Colorado Health to present. Hi, can everybody hear me okay? My name is Lisa. Um, I'm the cardiovascular coordinator for the Chest Pain Center here at UC Health and Memorial Hospital in Colorado Springs. And with me today is Melissa Barnes. She's our manager of our quality department. So a little bit about Memorial Hospital here in Colorado Springs. Um, we are part of the UC Health system in the state. And we, here in Colorado Springs, we serve El Paso County and all surrounding areas, which make up approximately almost 700,000 residents. We're the um, busiest emergency room in the state of Colorado, and we are actually uh, we're accredited and certified in chest pain center, PCI resuscitation, AFib, level one trauma center. We're the only level one trauma center in southern Colorado, and we service um, outlying states as well, New Mexico, Kansas, Oklahoma, Arizona areas as well. We're the only comprehensive stroke as well in the um, southern part of Colorado and service the same areas, and we also participate with um, Get With the Guidelines for Heart Failure. We decided to participate in this program um, a couple of years ago, basically based off of we, we needed to look at our, what our readmissions were doing and how we could keep them low if they are low or not. We weren't quite sure. What happened is that we had new direction and new people taking positions that we didn't really have. So it was a whole new experience for us. We figured this would be a way for us to get involved and start figuring out how we're doing everything and if we're doing it correctly. We felt that some of the benefits for this is going to be looking at the readmissions. Um, like I said, this was a whole new position, and readmissions weren't even being really followed prior to maybe 2014. Um, one of the things that we did see with this is that we did see a drop in some of our readmission rates for our AMI, and we also started to getting some people um, to collaborate and become interested in the program and look at it as an overhaul. And we're, it's given us an ability to look at our discharge process to make sure that we're doing what need, need, what, what's going to benefit the patient. Are these patients getting the right doctor when they're discharged? Are they being able to get into facilities? We're a large military community here. We have five military bases that surround our city. So then it gave us that other option where we have to work with our military bases to make sure we're getting these people into the proper areas that have the, the stuff that they need, as well as our um, veterans population, because we have a large VA population and work with satellite veterans clinics. Our homeless population, like a lot of other people in our indigent population, is very high out here. So trying to make sure that we have some type of facility or doctor who could follow up with these patients. And without taxing our system, and we work closely with an organization called Peak Vista, which is based at um, takes a lot of our Medicaid patients. So the top three strategies that we looked at implementing. So we looked at um, 
readmissions with our leadership to include our medical directors and our CVSL director. As I was saying earlier, we've had a lot of direction change here, so we we sometimes it seems like we're a little bit behind our curve, and it could be because since we've implemented this program, we we literally are on our third CVSL director. Um, so as we get new direction from each director, we kind of add more robust to it, and we have to go back and relook at things and make sure we're doing things correctly. We've also been learning to work with different departments prior to discharge for medications and home therapies. We do have a large holistic kind of community, not too far here in El Paso County, and trying to get some of these patients to want to take medication and not a vitamin or an herbal supplement has also been a challenge for us. And I'm sure some other hospitals have felt that as well. We've gotten pharmacy more involved with helping reconcile um, our MARs, our medical administration records, as well as talking to our patients about their medications and why. We've been working with nursing to identify which patients are a high risk for readmission. Is this patient homeless? Does this patient have insurance? Is there a support system at home? Um, and then we're, you know, we're making sure that case management and social work are also involved. We've had some roadblocks. Um, some of ours is our data pulling. And are we pulling our data mainly from the right place? Are we getting the right numbers? And that's always been, because some numbers that, depending on if we're pulling them straight out of the, um, our medical record, um, electronic medical record or Vizient. We found that Vizient is one of the places we do pull from. And our patients being coded correctly. This is a huge issue here as a lot of our coding is done at our um, main hospital up in Denver. So it's, we're dealing with how documentation looks in a chart and how the document looks and if they're even coded out correctly. A patient we may think is an AMI patient might code out renal failure. So then we're having to go back and look at documentation and coding. And that's a lot of it has been navigating through our EMR. Our EMR is not as user friendly for finding a lot of our patients and helping us pull and extract. So that's been a big challenge in working with our IT and people to help us figure that out. And then we're trying to figure out how do we better serve our underserved population and get more buy-in from our leadership team, um, our medical leadership team and case management. Some of the things we're doing to continue and try to get through these roadblocks and be better is just to get working with our medical leadership so that they can help us overcome these roadblocks and get them to understand the importance of this program, as well as the fact that we want to keep these readmissions you know, low. If we can keep these people out of the hospital, as we all know, it's going to increase their chances for a better survival rate, and they're not going to you know, be privy to all the all the grossness that's in a hospital, for lack of a better term. Um, we want to work with our teams to ensure that the families and the patients are getting the right and appropriate education and the medications prior to discharge. So we've been working with our case management people, and our social work department, as well as a lot of the nursing to say, are we using the same discharge packets throughout the hospitals here and within our system down here? And are we doing the same teaching so that the patient's not, say the patient shows up at um, our central campus and then three weeks later he's at the north campus, we want to make sure they're getting the same teaching and they understand the importance of their medications and stuff with that. Um, our metrics, I'll let Melissa discuss this part. <laughs> so we've been trying to do um, a large focus on our readmissions and what we have actually found is that we really do have a pretty low volume of readmissions when it comes to our AMI population and we would like to attribute that to the different work that Lisa has done in order to maintain and track our patients along with case management, health link, our providers and our physicians offices. So our goal moving forward is to continue to see a low readmission rate, and if we see any kind of uptick, to do a real, real-time deep dive into what's causing that uptick and make sure that it's not something that the program can fix itself. Um, we did find that with this patient navigator program that readmissions was a big focus and is something that we plan and continue to evaluate and work with case management on moving forward. And with that, I think we can, we are ready for any questions if anybody has any.
All right, great. Thank you, everybody. And uh, just a reminder, if you would like to submit a question, please type it into the chat box. That can be found on the bottom left corner of your screen. And uh, we do have a couple questions. I am going to start with the Hardin group since they were first. Um, first question, where does the funding come from for the telemonitoring? And then from a funding standpoint, we actually place that in our capital on an annual basis and have leadership approval uh, for that. Uh, that's nothing that we get funding from a foundation or from our board or what have you. We actually just put that in our annual budget from a capital expense. All right, great. Thank you. Another question for you all. Can you talk about how you're able to get the physicians involved and how do they share their data? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, from a physician standpoint, you know, we primarily focused on our cardiologists when we started this. We talked about the program itself, but we met consistently on a monthly basis and talked and was very vulnerable with what we needed to make this successful, um, rather just in the receiving the information passively. Uh, but I, I would say what really got them engaged was those consistent meetings being very vulnerable on our opportunities to improve. And then once we got to a point where we was seeing an improvement, then the physicians were able to brag on it and talk about it. And now we're at a point to where we're not meeting monthly, focused in on the patient navigator piece of that. We've actually rolled this up into our AMI meeting that meets bi-monthly. Um, so we're able to present the patient navigator specific program in with our AMI committee rather than focusing it independently. But I would say just consistent meetings, consistent conversation with those cardiologists, uh, basically not letting them miss a meeting, if that's, uh, I'll say that in fun, uh, but just keeping them engaged in the program because ultimately we needed their support for the, to keep all this going, I mean to keep the funding for the telemonitoring going and, and what have you. And also we've had some form of AMI program in place for at least the past 15 years. So this is just kind of added on to it. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is they they are they are used to hearing data and um, process improvements and that type of thing. All right, great, thank you. Our next question: How do you follow up? This is for Harden. Um, how do you follow up and keep track of the poorer population at about 30 to 90 days post discharge? Well, our follow-up calls are a 90-day, I mean are, are a 30-day uh, serial call. So they get two or more calls within 30 days. We have a um, program that we use that um, we, we ask these serial questions um, to these patients. We do not do anything over 30 days unless they are on the home telemonitoring program. Our focus was 30-day readmissions. Um, now those patients that are agreeable and are, um, that do qualify for the home telemonitoring program, their needs are addressed daily, if not weekly, for 90 days. Um, the case manager is in constant communication with them. All right, great, thank you. Um, our next question, uh, this is geared towards UC Health. Um, do you track, or I believe this is for UC Health, my apologies. Uh, do you track the NSTEMI and the STEMIs? Yes. <laughs> we track our NSTEMIs and our STEMIs as well as we try to pick up some of our unstable anginas. But it all, like I said, the unstable anginas are the harder ones because of the way they tend to code. All right, great. Our next question, can you talk about Peak Vista and what services they provide, and how exactly do you collaborate with them? That's for UC Health, of course. So Peak Vista is um, a, probably a clinic is the best name for it. It's a clinic here in Colorado Springs. It was started by the Alpamar Foundation, which is a big grant that has come from some of the founding fathers of our, our city. What Peak Vista service is, is that they provide to our under-provided populations, our Medicaid and our, um, some of our indigent population and uninsured population. They, um, they run as a total clinic from birth to, to old age, birth to death. 
They do a lot of um, a lot of counseling in some areas, but they're one of those, it's that fallback in a way that we have here so that if we do have an uninsured patient, we could get them on into some kind of a clinic where they could go and they'll, they'll charge them on a sliding scale and try to help them get into an insurance program. But we can, they will do their medications there. They'll make sure that they get that. One thing that they don't have is a cardiac rehab program. Um, unfortunately, there's just no way to staff it and provide for it due to the cost it would be for them. But they also help us work with us so that we could get them into cardiac rehab over here at our facility. They're, it, they're just an amazing group of doctors and nurses who help serve our underserved population. And like I said, they do take care of the patients from birth to death, so it's kind of nice. And our case managers do meet, meet with Peak Vista um, biweekly, if not monthly, in order to make sure that we're meeting each other's needs. And so there is a pretty active working relationship there between the two. All right. And then for UC Health, do you also do a 30, 90 day follow up on any of your patients? Our follow ups are a little different. Um, we're getting better, I'm going to say, at our 30 day follow up. We do have a, um, within our system here, we have um, a department that's called our Health Link. I send them and they pull reports every week and day, basically every day, and they go through and they look for all our STEMI, non-STEMI, and ACS patients. They will do a 24 to 48 hour call, and on some of them that require the 30 day call, um, they will do a 30-day call as well. So they do what we um, the core measure calls for us. They have a scripted set of lines that they ask. This is run by all nurses so that they are able to set up referrals if they need them, get them into the doctor's office if needed because they have direct lines to the doctor's offices to make sure they get back in. And they can also help get medications renewed if that's also needed on that 30-day. And we also have the ability to document everything within the electronic medical record. All right, great. Our next question, um, if we can do a round robin, we want to hear from both UC Health and Harden. So let's start with Harden. Do you track reasons for readmissions, and do you have a readmissions team? Um, as far as readmissions team, we have a, a readmission committee um, that includes pharmacy, um, our medical director, um, case management, disease management, and IT, uh, and we meet monthly. We also, as the case managers, have a weekly meeting, um, and we address any patient that has been readmitted in the last 30 days. So every seven days we're talking about those patients, looking at uh, is there something that we could have done to prevent this, um, looking at medications, looking at discharge instructions, the reasons why they were readmitted. And we are getting ready to implement a daily readmission rounding with the hospitalist. Um, that is in the works, um, so we're hoping by the first of the year that that is something that we're able to do on a daily basis. And this is Amber. I specifically do look at the AMI uh, readmissions quarterly and report those to the case managers and at our AMI meetings. All right, great. Thank you. Now we'll hop over to the UC Health uh, group. Same question. Do you track reasons for readmissions, and do you have a readmissions team? Yes, to both. Um, I get a list every month on our readmissions, and I go through every single one of our AMI re readmissions to see why were they here. Did they have the right treatment on their way home, on their discharge? Were they seen by case management and social worker? Did OTP, TCM, did cardiac rehab visit with them prior to discharge? I go through all their MARS and everything. And then I also look through, because if they are in our system, I could check and see if they've been following up with their physicians um, post-discharge, because if they're in our system, that physician's discharge will be in our system. So I look through that, too, to see did they make their follow-up appointment? Did they actually show up for their follow-up appointment? Um, as well as looking at why did they come back? Did they come back for something totally different that's not even related to the AMI, but it just fell on our you know, radar? And um, 
we kind of I look at it that way. We do have readmission committee, and we do meet, and then we start talking about you know we're looking for the trend. What are, what are we seeing? Are we seeing people coming back because they've all got the flu right now, or is it because they didn't go home with the medication, but then we noticed that pharmacy never saw, and are we seeing a trend in that? So we're looking for that trend to see if we could fix it. All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, just another uh, mention, we'll do another last call for questions. If you have any, please get them on in to the chat box, bottom left. Um, another question for UC Health. Do you use a database to pull these AMI readmissions? Yeah, we utilize Vizient. So Vizient is one of the data models that we use here to pull a lot of our mortality and readmission rates because it allows us to compare ourselves to our sister hospitals and other hospitals throughout the United States that are on the Vizient platform. Um, so basically, I'm sure a lot of people are on Vizient that are on this call as well. We do a data upload to Vizient monthly, and then we are able to do drill downs and analyze readmissions, mortality, all those different things that tie back to our patients. So Vizient's one of our biggest portals, and then our EMR is epic. We try to utilize that as well, but it's not as easy to navigate. All right, great. All right, another call for questions. While we are waiting, um, oh, excuse me, we do have another one. What do uh, I guess this will be for both groups? Uh, what do we use for their EMR? What do you use for your EMR? We use Meditech. Oh, so we use Epic over at UC Health. All right. Great. Um, all right. Uh, Julie, while we wait to see if any additional questions come in, I do know there are some other announcements. Um, would we like to go ahead and address those in the interim? Yes. Um, I can move on and, and just talk about a couple of different things. Sure, the last couple of slides. And then if any other questions come in, just let me know. Will do. Thank you. So I, I just wanted to wrap up and uh, mention some key lessons that we've learned over the last couple of years, as well as uh, prior from the original uh, Patient Navigator program. Best practices, it, it has become so important to share and really learn from others. Um, data collection, um, building your teams and dedicating those resources. I think the biggest thing is is really trying to find the resources. Who who can you pull from within your facility to be able to collect and run reports and and get the the data that you need? Pharmacy, integral part of the team, um, the care team as. As uh, both hospitals have mentioned today, um, you have to have them as part of the, your care team. So understanding goals and the reasons for the change. Why are you doing what you're doing? It's a, a big part of pulling together and collaborating within your facility. We've talked about this a lot too, communication. The better the team communication is, the better they can address problems um, before they become problems and readmissions. And collaboration is key with your physicians, your communities, um, patients, all of that. Automation, as much as you can automate, it improves the processes to be able to prepare reports and find out really what's going on within your facility. So where do we go from here? We've talked, again, a little bit about the underserved population and the challenges that, pop that population presents, some wonderful um, services at both areas of the hospitals. Um, so just don't forget the, those people. Sustaining your, sustaining your programs, show and share your data, that's really going to 
come from and move forward what it is you're trying to do, any of the changes. Continuous learning and sharing. Uh, we do have an active listserv. I encourage all of you to use it. It's easy to use and a good conversation for learning and sharing. And then the last thing I want to mention is really promoting the work that you're doing at each of your facilities. The Quality Summit in 2020 is coming up. Uh, present a poster. Show those uh, others how you can make the changes at your facility. So, Kendra, I'm going to just um, – this is the learning uh, – or the listserv address. And then if there are any other questions, go ahead and ask those, and we'll wrap up. All right. We did actually get an additional question, Julie. So that one – this one is related to MI mortality and our purpose to join the Patient Navigator Program. Uh, to confirm, it's to reduce STEMI mortality. How can we reduce the AMI mortality? Is anyone able to address that? That's a hard one um, because your patients tend to be sometimes older and sicker, and they have a lot of other comorbidities that play in. I think we could reduce the rate on our younger population if we could get the education out there and focus MI may not be almost the right platform. However, if we could get people to stop smoking, vaping, eating right, and getting some exercise, because I don't know about some of the other hospitals throughout the United States, I do know that we are seeing a, a slightly younger age on our um, STEMI population. I'm, and when I say slightly younger, I'm talking 30s, 40s, and 50s. So that's our biggest challenge also for discharge, and this is where the program is actually very helpful. So the 30-year-old patient is that patient that you could do good education with, and you could try to keep them out of here so that they have a higher chance of survival rate going forward. They're just not as apt to want to learn or change some of their habits yet as, say, somebody who's in their 50s or 60s who, who sees life a little differently. So. It's really a hard question to answer, and it would be really nice if we could get the numbers lower, but I think a lot of it's going to end up being education, education, education. And I agree with that, and that was very well said. Not a whole lot to add other than if we could ever find a way to get individuals a little bit more accountable for their own health. And I think this generation that's coming up, you know, I guess you want to speak millennial or what that is, Hopefully, the, the, the trend will be to consistently see them understanding their health care, what options are out there, so ultimately they can be held a little bit more accountable for the decisions they make for health care. Because I agree, we're starting to see, you know, uh, bad STEMIs on patients in their 30s and then to their 40s, which is something that you didn't see as much or didn't seem like you've seen as much 20 years ago. All right. Thanks, everyone. Then another question. What is your process, um, I believe it's your pro process for patients for coding out appropriately? I'm going to defer that to Melissa. <laughs> so I have the wonderful task of pulling our patient list weekly for my abstractors and my coordinators. And what we end up doing is the abstraction team, when they're going through and entering those patients into the registries, they are very well versed in what to look for and whether or not a patient should be coded the way that they're coded. If they have any kind of question in regards to the coding of the patient, we have a um, CDI team and a data integrity quality team that we then forward the account onto who does a deeper review of the chart to analyze if the coding was appropriate or not. If they find any kind of discrepancy in what they think should be coded, it then gets forwarded on to the coders for it to be fixed and recoded. And here at Hard Memorial, we do have a coding team, and um, that gets pulled from a database, my ultimate list that I end up sending to um, the Patient Navigator Program. Occasionally when I am reviewing the chart, there may be something that's coded a non-STEMI that should be a STEMI or vice versa, and we talk with the um, documentation specialist about that. 
All right, great. Well, that looks like that is all the questions for today. So um, I think we can wrap up unless anybody has any final thoughts or closing comments to add. I know Julie had her announcements, but um, anyone from Harden or UC Health? No, you see health pretty good. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And with that, we will conclude today's online seminar. A special thank you to our presenters and all of our participants for joining today. Today's program is copyright 2019 by the American College of Cardiology with all rights reserved. This concludes today's program. Thank you for joining us. You may now discuss.